Okay, so let's have uh, the second part of our short introduction to quantum computing of the theory uh, session. And uh, we will see one or two more algorithms and a few more differences to classical uh, computing. And uh, from our first session, I only need a very few things and I would like to recall them very quickly. So recall, the qubit is just an element of our uh, two-dimensional uh, space over complex number over C. And uh, I uh, denote the basis, uh, uh, my orthonormal basis as cat zero and cat one. <clears throat> so the qubit is a unit vector from that uh, space. And then there was the quantum register, which is just an n-fold tensor product of uh, qubits, which is then a unit vector of the n-fold tensor space of these two-dimensional spaces. And we had <clears throat> yeah, a very nice uh, notation. So the qubit is uh, symbolized by cat zero, cat one. So um, a quantum register uh, can be represented by the basis states, which are all combinations of the individual qubits. So this looks here like that. So we can just write this binary sequence here inside. Yeah, so we would have cat one, zero, one, something like that. Um, so we just drop uh, these symbols. And then there was the other um, additional uh, notation that we then shorten this even more. So instead of that, we could just write cat three. And we had the uh, superposition of such a quantum register, which can then be written as the sum, the coefficient ci cat i, cat i is the basis states, and we have two to the power of n basis states. Then uh, the next thing we need to recall, unitary operators are the linear operators that move quantum registers to quantum registers. So uh, unitary, they keep the property that the norm of the vector is one, so that it is a unit vector. Uh, so all our operations are unitary operators. We had the superposition and the superposition gave us then a certain parallelism. Um, so if your state is here in this superposition, then applying the unitary operator, we get a certain kind of uh, parallelism so that uh, we can move the sum and the coefficients out and we have a superposition of u applied to the individual basis states. Uh, but maybe I have to stress at this point that you should be aware of that a classical computer would map in a function um, a value x Know, say a binary number to a different binary number. Uh, so if you have a function on eight bits, yeah, the result is just um, a different eight bit representation. So that would look like uh, as if uh, classical U applied to a basis state is some basis state Y, a specific one. Uh, uh, but in quantum, we actually can map a basis state to a superposition of other basis state. Yeah? So there could be here some alpha one cat y one plus alpha two cat y two. So actually it is a little bit like we can map one value to different values. If you think in probabilities to different probabilities of values, but actually the coefficients can cancel. So we can create strange interferences between the results, yeah? So that's um, a difference. It's not only the parallelism, it's also that the operator can map to different values. Actually, it's not mapping values, it's mapping coefficients to coefficients. That's maybe a better interpretation. So next thing I like to uh, recall because we need it later, yeah? Uh, we had a few examples of these operators, Haddad mart gate, is uh, such a gate that creates out of a basis state, a superposition of basis states, yeah? cat plus or cat minus. 
Hadamard gate applied to every qubit individually. Yeah? So uh, N Hadamard gate gives us uh, this nice representation here. So here with a coefficient that is uh, minus one and then the number of common bits. And if you apply it to X being zero, then there is here zero and something. Zero and something is zero. Yeah? So the number of bits is always zero. So this coefficient here is zero. So if you apply a Hadamard gate to every qubit, it will create uh, a superposition of every basis state in the tensor space. Yeah? So also very nice thing actually the guy which you need in the Grover uh, algorithm to perform this, uh, to create the space state uh, S. Next thing was a conditional uh, phase shift. Yeah? So we can, we can turn the phase, the coefficient here in front of uh, the one one. Uh, and the swap bit was uh, also uh, useful. So we will also uh, use, it, use it later. So I like to just recall that. And now let's uh, continue uh, with the lecture. So I like to um, discuss a few, a selection um, of a few topics. Yeah, here I choose uh, functions and no cloning. There are many topics that should be touched, yeah, like error correction, uh, which are maybe requiring a little bit more time. Uh, for uh, the algorithms which we will look at, we need uh, surely functions. So let's discuss uh, this a little bit. So <clears throat> consider that you have a function that maps an n qubit register to an m qubit register. So actually there's a typo on the slide. Actually I'm considering here a function that maps a classical register. So an n bit register, which means it maps a number between zero and two to the power of n minus one to a classical m register, m bit register. Uh, so to a number between zero and two to the power of m min uh, minus one. Um, so um, you could fix the slide and say, just remove here the qubit. But of course I can also consider this functions on qubit. It will just map basis states to basis states. So it's an n bit value that is mapped to an m bit value. Yeah, if you would like to be more precise, I have, I have this function. How can I represent this function now in uh, a quantum computer? The uh, point is I cannot represent this by a unitary operator if n is not equal to m for sure, yeah, because then it's not invertible. Uh, and even if n is equal to m, uh, I do not know if it is invertible. The function could, for example, map everything to zero. Yeah? It would not be uh, invertible. So I have a problem in my quantum computer. I would like to have a unitary operator and that needs to be reversible. So how can I represent this function? Uh, the cure is, well, in mathematical finance, you sometimes also have the state space extension. Yeah? We need to extend our state space. So to represent the function by um, a unitary operation, they call it UF, we may extend the state space. So we consider now an N plus M qubit register. So we need more memory for this. And we carry the input values with us in the first component. So what we do is we carry the input values into the output values by just remembering what was the argument. And if I know the argument, I can of course invert it because I know, and I know the input value. So what I do is I map now um, X, tensor product zero to x tensor product f of x. For every x, I have a single value f of x. So I can immediately tell you the inverse. And then I'm just mapping all the m minus one, uh, two to the power of m minus one orthogonal states. So orthogonal here to this input value. So all the others 
I map it just to the orthogonal states of cat f of x. And then this is a unitary um, operation. Yeah? So you see, there is a huge waste of memory. Yeah? I just need here one value, but I extend here the state space by a whole bunch um, of bits. Yeah? So that's an issue, but this is a way I can represent this function. Consider the special case that F maps, okay, maybe you can also here fi fix the uh, same typo, uh, an N bit value to an one bit value. Yeah? So it maps to zero and one. Yeah? So that was a function which we had in the Kova algorithm and it will also appear uh, in one of our next examples. Yeah? So I have, the well, simple case that my m from the previous slide is equal to one, then I can just write you this uh, unitary operator here. So my unitary operator uf is mapping x tensor product zero to x tensor product f of x. And if f of x is with zero or one, the orthogonal value, the opposite value is just one or zero, yeah? so we will just map here x tensor product one to x tensor product one minus f of x. And sometimes you find the notation that here this part, uh, it can also be written as the modulus two addition or the XOR. Yeah? So uh, here this operation with the plus Okay, this is mapping zero plus zero um, to zero, uh, one plus zero to uh, one, zero plus one to one, and one plus one uh, to zero. Yeah? So that's, that's uh, the operation. So sometimes you see this notation and we have here a very nice form where I now have on my extended state space, uh, a unitary operator. <clears throat> that encodes the function uh, in, in terms of uh, unitary operations. So this also illustrates that in order to be reversible, it needs to increase the memory requirements. And we have another example pointing into uh, this direction. Before I do that, this example also motivates that I would maybe like to reuse some registers. Okay, so how could you reuse a register? You see what you do here is you initialize an initial value to zero and then you use it for your calculation. So you could just say after you have used this um, and uh, you would like to reuse uh, the register, you could just reinitialize this guy to zero. But initialization is expensive. Yeah, Loading the system is expensive. So an um, alternative to this is to do uncomputation. Yeah? This sounds strange, but uh, the trick to reuse um, a register is instead of uh, reinitializing, which would be an operation that is not reversible. Uh, so it is like something stopping the system. Yeah? So that is not something feasible. Uh, instead of that, we just reverse the operations partially to arrive back at the initial value. Uh, and an algorithm which we will see later does this. Yeah, Actually in that example, we could, we, we do not need to do it yeah, because it's at the end of the calculation, but I, I, I have an example uh, where this can be done. So this is sometimes called uncomputation. Um, okay, so you see, uh, in a classical computer, you can just reinitialize um, some memory and continue with the new value. And you never need to do to reverse these calculation steps. And here we have some, we have certain things that uh, come into play because uh, everything works a little bit different. Yeah. So there's a, a technique called uh, uncomputation. 
even a little bit more on a theoretical level, but very easy to prove, there is the no cloning theorem that you cannot create a copy of a value. And that's an interesting difference. So given an arbitrary uh, state, say cat psi uh, in our space H, could be the tensor space, uh, consider an operator on the space H tensor product H here. So um, could be a state space extension U. Yeah, so I consider now an operator U. And now there is no unitary operator U such that U psi zero, or oh, actually I should write, my, my notation is not so consistent here, I should write psi tensor product zero, maps to psi psi. Yeah? So there's no, gen, in general, there's no operator that maps all arbitrary states, yeah, uh, psi zero to psi psi. So I cannot copy the value. And I would need to copy the value if you need an, a value in a certain calculation, if you need it in two, for two, two different things. Yeah? In a classical computer, that's no problem. Yeah? You just store your value and then it's input to one calculation and then it's input to another calculation. And you have two results that depended on the same uh, intermediate value. So we cannot do this in the quantum computer. You can prove that this holds. Yeah? So proof here is uh, exercise, but actually uh, the proof is also a few slides uh, later. Yeah? So it's uh, trivial. So in a quantum computer, we cannot duplicate um, at least exactly yeah, a state. Note, of course, you could perform a measurement and reinitialize this measurement as an input, but this is not the same. You lose the superposition. Uh, and this theorem shows us another important uh, difference to uh, the classical uh, computer. Yeah? So if we need to use a value twice on diverging computation paths, we cannot reuse it. So what you could do is you just make the same calculation twice. So you just make the same calculation twice, you get the same output value, and then you could continue. Yeah? So you need to double the memory. Let me illustrate this uh, by looking back to a classical computer. So consider an example where you have here two values, say there is y and there is uh, z. So y and the z depend on the same input value x. Yeah? So in a classical computer, you can just store x, call the function f, call the function g yeah, and get the two results. So point is here, I would like to illustrate this in a classical computer. Um, if you think of object oriented programming and the X is an object and F is a method that modifies the object, you already have this problem in the object oriented implementation because it's not functional programming. In functional programming, you always create a new result but in an object oriented thinking, I modify now the object. F modifies X to become Y. So if you think of, uh, say, um, interpret the function F as a method acting on an object, then F modifies X to become Y. And this is what is happening in a quantum computer. We modify a state to become a new state. And if you would have this situation in a classical computer, then you would also need to do a, a cloning operation. So in this case, you need to perform a cloning operation. So before you start, you create a copy of your X and then you can do the two steps. So it can be that X becomes Y via the F and the U, so the cloned one, which is actually then the same uh, value becomes the set. 
you call the method G on the U and you call the method F on the X. And you see that also a classical framework that is object oriented uh, would have the need to perform this cloning. So a little bit modifying the states is like looking at objects that are modified. It's not like functional programming. Uh, and we have this cloning. And now we have the theorem that tells us this operation does not exist in a quantum computer. So this operation does not exist. So the consequence is that for every cloning, we require maybe separate storage, more quantum registers. So we require more qubits. Yeah, we could carry something in parallel. And you see that this is already uh, an issue because um, number of qubits is a precious, precious thing. Nevertheless, there is something called quantum copying. So we can copy states, but only in an approximate sense. And um, to illustrate this, uh, first note, if you have a classical uh, bit, you know, a classical qubit, uh, you can create a copy using a C not gate on a zero. Yeah? So a C not gate is creating um, a classical, yeah, so it is creating the not for the zero if the other one is a one, yeah, so it is creating uh, the copy. So, and if you do not require an exact copy, there are methods to create um, approximate copies. Uh, I don't go into details, but you maybe can, can look this up. Yeah, it's also mathematical theory. Uh, so to, to illustrate this uh, situation, and this is also then, kind of proof for the no cloning. Consider uh, an arbitrary state. So we start here with an arbitrary state alpha cat zero plus beta cat one. And we are looking for uh, a unitary operator U that allows to perform um, a copy in the sense yeah, we have uh, mentioned. So, um, since uh, u is um, a unitary operator, I can just, uh, it's a linear operator, I can just plug in here the definition of this uh, uh, state uh, phi. Uh, and since it's a linear operator, you just get uh, alpha times u zero zero, beta times u one one. And then you can use the copy property on these basis states, yeah? So it will copy here the zero to the zero and the one to a one. And you see that if I now just use, okay, let's maybe I'd call this here star, yeah? So I can just write uh, that I use here star. Uh, so you see that uh, you get alpha times zero, zero, beta times one, one from the property that I have a linear operator. Uh, reversing the two steps. So first considering I do a copy and then plugging in the definition of the state phi. Uh, so you see there is here u phi zero. Uh, I create a copy of that. So this is here now my definition star. Uh, maybe I take a bit stronger colors. This is my star. Yeah. Then I know this is phi phi. And now I plug in the definition of phi. Okay, so you see this is alpha cat zero plus beta cat one. Tensor product alpha cat zero plus beta cat one. Yeah, so you see sometimes I'm a bit sloppy. Yeah, here I'm just always omitting the tensor product symbol. So I can multiply this out and you see it's alpha squared zero zero plus beta squared one one compared to these guys, plus some mixed term. And you see uh, the copy works if alpha is equal to one and beta is equal to zero, because then everything is nice and to agree or vice versa. So in other words, it holds if my original state was just a basis state. So I can copy with um, this um, operator classical uh, states, but the thing that breaks down is the superposition. Uh, 
So that does not work. So you see such an operator cannot exist because in general, the two do not agree. And in the case where it's a classical bit, this is actually the C not operator, the XOR operator. So from this, you see that this no cloning restriction is related to uh, superposition and that we are in a tensor space and that allows to model entanglement. So entanglement is the big advantage because it makes the sp space so large, two to the power of n, and we can create these correlations and interference, but it also provides us with a disadvantage. We cannot create a perfect uh, clone. Let's look at this um, again. What happens if you just use the XOR to this qubit in superposition? Uh, so if you go back to the same example and you say, okay, let's take here a state uh, psi uh, alpha zero zero plus beta one zero. Yeah, so the second argument is the zero and apply the XOR operator the XOR gate to copy uh, the bit here. So copy this one to the zero to get one, one. If you apply this, you get our uh, entangled uh, state. Uh, you get alpha zero, zero plus beta one, one. Isn't this a perfect copy operation? Uh, so that unitary operator exists. Well, to some extent, it is too perfect because now the first and the second bit are maximally entangled. Yeah? And uh, whatever you do to one affects the other. And that is not what you like to have. Yeah? You would like to have two independent streams of calculation. Yeah? So I would like to have an unentangled uh, uh, copy mechanism. Uh, so uh, you see uh, it's a copy, but it's too the copy is uh, too perfect. Yeah, it's uh, I cannot I cannot uh, distinguish uh, the two two uh, elements. So we would like to work on them independently. Uh, a last remark in this section where I go to yeah uh, a mixture uh, of uh, many different uh, topics is that of pure states and mixed state. So I was here in this uh, lecture always talking about uh, pure states. So uh, qubits and quantum registers are unit vectors. Okay, there's a small typo here. Uh, unit vectors uh, having norm uh, one. Yeah, so let's uh, let's write this like that. Having Norm one, okay. Um, so uh, then these states that have norm one are also called pure states. So whenever I was talking here um, about a qubit or a quantum register, I was talking about a pure state. Uh, in the literature, you also find uh, mixed states. So mixed states are states, okay, there's the same typo here, where the norm of the state is smaller than one. So if you interpret the uh, coefficient as, um, uh, if you interpret the coefficients as probabilities, yeah, uh, you see that the probabilities do not sum up to one. So there is something missing. So there is some uncertainty. And uh, this mixed state could be represented by infinitely many uh, pure states. Yeah, so there is, uh, yeah, so I mean, that's, that's also easy to see if you have here, uh, say, the unit sphere and you have here um, some vector. So that's now my mixed state inside this unit. And the length is smaller than zero. Okay, then you can uh, represent this by a different, uh, uh, by, by a sum of different uh, vectors. Yeah, you could, you could uh, uh, say, go um, a little bit into uh, that direction and a little bit into that direction. Yeah, to, um, uh, to represent this uh, vector. Yeah, so the guy that is missing here could be that guy or could be some other guy.
Okay, so we don't discuss uh, this uh, here. Okay, so that was my small tour through uh, functions, no cloning and uh, uncomputation. And we will see a few aspects of this in our next algorithm. Yeah, the next algorithm, the Deutsch-Schose algorithm is also a very nice example. Maybe I like the Kova algorithm a little bit more because there you also see this feature with the probability a bit nicer. But what's now nice is the Kova algorithm had a improvement, uh, quadratic improvement. So it was instead of n steps, it was square root of n steps. And this algorithm has an exponential um, improvement. The problem is similar. So we are now given a function f. So this function maps from the numbers 0 to 2 to the power of n minus 1. So an n bit binary number uh, to zero one, so a one bit binary number. And we know from the beginning that this function is either constant or is balanced. So the function is either constant means it's always zero or always one, or the function is balanced. So what does uh, balanced mean? So balanced means that the numbers of zero and ones that occur are the same. Yeah? So it's maybe alternating yeah, or whatever. Uh, so that we don't know, uh, but we know that the number of zeros and the number of ones are the same. So a balanced function is a function where the set where the function is zero and the set where the function is one, they have the same size. Okay. and we like to find an algorithm that finds out if the function is constant or not, uh, if it is balanced. So we would like to determine if the function is constant. So the problem appears a bit academic, yeah, but uh, it gives us a very nice intuition yeah, of what where quantum computer algorithms uh, differ. And if you would like to test this in a classical computer, you would need two to the power of n half plus one step testing uh, function evaluations in the worst case, yeah? because it could be that you always observe zero, 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 but you don't know uh, if there is the other half, one, one, one. Yeah? So the worst case is you have to test all half plus one uh, values uh, to uh, find this out. Yeah? So if the um, half plus one value suddenly has the same value as all the, before it is constant, otherwise it is the balanced one. Yeah? The function can only have these two properties. Okay, so you need order of two to the power of n half, yeah? so two to the power of n minus, minus one plus one, operations to find this uh, answer. And the quantum computer algorithm will create by transforming the states a certain amplification or cancellation such that you see the answer immediately. And we only need very few, say n such transformations. So that's just a summary of what I said. So if you consider a classical algorithm, you would need two to the power of n half plus one valuations or tests. Yeah. So checks of the result to uh, solve uh, the problem. And here we find an algorithm that only requires order of n additional operation in addition to valuing the function using a unitary operator. Uh, so that's uh, one additional um, operation. So I assume I have the function in terms of a unitary operator. So this performance improvement is exponential. 
okay, so here is how the um, algorithm works. Uh, and um, I will also then uh, discuss the implementation in more detail. So first I assume that I have an Oracle. So that is a unitary operator that is associated with the function, namely that it implements the function in a certain way. And we will discuss how we create this U of F. Um, so U maps X to minus one to the power of X times cat X. So uh, whenever the function, uh, sorry, there is a typo here. This should be F of X, right? Yeah, you, you, see, it, you see it below here. This is F of X. Maybe let's fix this. Otherwise it wouldn't make sense, right? Okay, so uh, whenever the function maps to one, it will flip the sign of the state where it maps to one. Otherwise it will keep the sign of the state. Uh, so you see that this is actually just a phase shift a special phase shift. So if F is equal to one, then U of UF applies a phase shift to the state X. Assume we have this U, this we will discuss it then in a few uh, seconds, a few minutes. The algorithm goes as follows. Initialize first uh, a state phi to zero. And here I use the uh, symbol phi in every step, but note that this is now like modifying an object. The state phi will, will be modified from step to step. Yeah? So mathematically you could use phi zero for the initial one, phi one for the next one and so on. Yeah? Maybe that's a bit sloppy. I modify now the state phi. So first thing is that we apply the Hadamard gate to every qubit. And remember, we had the slide applying the Hadamard gate to every qubit. If the state phi is zero, then the state phi, which was zero before, moves to the superposition of all states. So it is this state, the superposition of all basis states. So now apply our function uf to this phi. So next step is that I apply the function uf, so our unitary operator, to the state phi. So the claim is that this will move the phi to the superposition of all states, where in front I have a minus one f of x. Okay, that's easy, yeah, because the operator is linear. Yeah, so you can just move the uh, coefficient and the sum in front. And you see, I just get here the factor minus one f of x in front of the x. So I have applied uf. So now I apply the Hadamard gate again to every qubit of this state uh, phi. Yeah? So I apply now the, again the Hadamard gate to every qubit, but I apply it so, so here to this state phi. So, but since um, this is a linear operation, this means moving that here in front and applying the Hadamard gate to every qubit of a state x. And that was also what we had on this slide where we discussed the Hadamard gate. Uh, so what you get if you now apply the Hadamard gate to every qubit on the basis state, it will move this basis state to this expression where you get a minus one in the top uh, you, so where you get a minus one in the coefficient in front of a, a state cat y, if you have an odd number of common bits in x and y. So you 
could go back to that slide. Yeah, it was on the Hadamard gate. So this is how the Hadamard gate applied to every qubit modifies um, a basis state X. Yeah, then you can just um, take here this stuff, yeah, and plug it into the definition of phi. So if you plug this into the definition of phi, you get a minus one to the power of the number of common bits uh, multiplied here with the state y. So if I plug this in here in the previous formula, I also have the coefficient minus one to the power of f of x. So I still have here the coefficient minus one to the power of x, which is from the definition of phi. Yeah? So plugging just the cat x into the uh, cat uh, phi uh, definition, uh, we get now that phi uh, looks like that after we have applied the Hadamard gate to this phi. Okay, now that looks ugly, that looks complicated, but uh, what is the probability that phi is equal to zero, 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 zero? That's the norm square of the coefficient cat zero. So that's just this guy here for y equals zero. So that guy for y equals zero norm squared is the probability of measuring phi being in state zero. And now look at this coefficient. If y is equal to zero, So you have y is equal to zero. It means that you have a zero here, right? And this number of common bits is zero. Yeah? So this whole guy here is equal to zero for y equal to zero. So you see that this coefficient squared is just the sum minus one to the power of f of x, yeah, one divided by two to the power of n to norm it squared. And you see now that this sum, if the function is balanced, you have as many minus ones as you have ones. This guy is zero if the function is balanced. And if the function is constant, yeah, it's either minus one or one, but squared it is one. It's one. So you see that this creates some kind of resonance, yeah, some kinds of interference that the probability is perfectly one if the function is constant to measure phi being zero and the probability is zero if the function is balanced and is something in between if the function is not constant but not really balanced. So we just need to measure now um, every qubit, and if we measure always a zero, then the function is constant, yeah? Because then with probability one, we have measured zero. But maybe we have to repeat this experiment because there is some noise, yeah? So to get a more reliable result, but in theory, actually, there is no, the probability is perfectly one or perfectly zero, but in, in, in theory, yeah? uh, uh, it is uh, one measurement would be enough. Okay. Um, so, the thing is that finding if the function is constant or balanced relies on a kind of interference. 
And in the end, we do not look at any individual value of the function. Yeah? I, I have not looked at the uh, function. I mean, I have used the operator uf, but I have used it to create some kind of interference. So in the end, we do not know an individual value. And that's maybe also some kind of principle here. Yeah? And also very nice of this algorithm is that it makes use of the fact that the coefficients and phase factors can be negative and can cancel. Yeah? So you see that here, uh, these guys that appear here, the square of it or so are associated with probabilities, but here the superpositions, they, they cancel uh, if the function is balanced and create a probability of zero. Yeah? So it's uh, important that the coefficient is number of C yeah, and can be can be negative. So how do we implement this algorithm? So let's see how we implement this. First of all, how do we create this unitary operator UF? So the first thing is that we create our state space extension. So I have a function F mapping an n bit value to an one bit value. So maybe you can also fix that here if you would like to be a little bit more precise. So it maps n bit values uh, to the one bit value, um, but you can associate it with the cat um, x. And we do this extension from our um, slide on functions. So um, see our section on functions, we define the unitary operator that maps cat x cat y to cat x carrying the input y plus f of x. Yeah? And here the plus is this um, x or operator or the modulus two addition. Yeah? So zero, zero maps to zero, zero, one maps to one, one, zero to one. Yeah. So, and note it is invertible. Yeah? It's actually set set is the uh, identity. So claim if you have this um, extension, then your function uf on this extended space is given by um, applying the Hadamard. Uh, so first applying the not gate uh, to uh, zero then applying the Hadamard gate to, if you apply not to zero, it becomes a one, to one. So applying the Hadamard gate, then I apply the function Z. I apply the function Z that will mix everything together. Yeah? So because the Z is here defined um, on all values. And then uh, I can also do some kind of uncomputation uh, to the last bit. So I can apply the Hadamard gate again and the X um, again. And um, this is um, on this augmented space. So there is here the um, identity. So the two operation, not and Hadamard are only on the last, uh, on the last bit. To see that this uh, works, yeah, so we go through uh, these uh, steps here. Yeah, so the operator is, uh, we read it from right to, to left. So first apply the X that will move a zero to a one. So the not gate, then apply the Hadamard gate. The Hadamard gate applied to the one will move it to cat minus the superposition of zero and uh, one with coefficient one over square root of two and minus one over square root of two. And then if you apply the set to this augmented thing, X and minus, we will get the function minus one to the power of F of X times X zero minus minus one to the power of F of X, X one. And you see, this, this is just, uh, you can move this factor in front. Uh, this is just minus one to the power of X, uh, to the power of F of X, cat X cat minus. Uh, so it's just the original state with this additional factor. So the question is maybe a little bit, how do we see this here that 
z applied to this gives me this this uh, coefficient yeah so go back note that z is just keeping here the input state and then it's creating here the y plus f of x so if y is zero and f of x is zero, then this zero plus zero maps to zero. So we get a plus zero. So it will act on the zero. The zero has a plus coefficient. So I get a plus. So if um, f of x was zero, I get a coefficient with a plus. And um, I have a zero here. So if y is one and f of x is one, one plus one is uh, zero. Yeah? Um, uh, so, but I um, uh, apply this to the one. Uh, if I apply it to the one, I have a minus coefficient. Uh, so the minus coefficient is mapped to minus zero. So you see, I get in front of the cat zero, I get a minus one yeah? and minus one to the power of one is minus one, yeah? f of x was one. And you can also check the other two cases that this agrees. Okay, so you see, maybe a little bit uh, strange, but we can create this unitary operator given that we have this uh, function. And then comes the uncomputation step. Yeah? So now I have um, a cat x cat minus, and if you apply the Hadamard gate again to the minus, you will get the original state, you will get the one. So I apply the Hadamard gate here again to the last bit. And then if I apply the not gate again to the one, I get the zero. So you see these two guys here are a partial uncomputation only for the last bit. After that, the last bit is again in the state zero where it was originally. And this operator in the middle has mixed the stuff to the other bits that we would like to have. So I could create this uh, function uf by um, this. And now my um, algorithm here told me that in addition, I have to apply the Hadamard gate to every other qubit, you know, the, the one on the top. So, and uh, I also do that um, um, after applying the function. So um, I, I apply um, again the Hadamard gate uh, to every qubit. Uh, so you see that the whole algorithm then looks like that, apply the Hadamard gate to all the other qubits and leave the last qubit now untouched. So I have H tensor product identity on the last one, UF H tensor product identity, and that's all. So, the algorithm or the circuit looks like that. So this here is the uh, construction of the function uf, including the uncomputation that the output state is again, the original state zero here. And we just have to perform now here um, a measurement if this guy is equal to uh, zero. Uh, so we just perform a measurement if this guy is equal to zero and we know um, the answer to the question. Okay, so how many gates uh, do we need? Yeah, so you need uh, as many gates as you have bits. Yeah? So, uh, maybe these two more, and you need in addition, uh, this guy. Huh? So I need n operations, order n operations to find the answer. Yeah? So you see uh, the workload is associated with the number of bits, n bits, and not with the number of states, two to the power of n states, different values. Yeah? So I can create this interference by working on the bits. And this is an exponential advantage. So we need to test um, all n qubits if they are zero or not. Yeah? Uh, you may apply some more transforms 
just such that you only need to test one uh, bit then in the end. Um, but I leave that uh, um, out. Yeah, maybe it's uh, again a nice um, opportunity to comment a little bit on the difference between classical uh, computing and quantum computing. I already mentioned a little bit the link to uh, object-oriented programming when I was talking about no cloning. And maybe I can just um, recall this a little bit. So you have different programming paradigmas. Yeah, For example, object-oriented, an object represents a state. And then you have methods that modify this states. So in this thinking, um, objects are often mutable. Yeah? So I believe the original thinking is that objects object mutate, yeah? they, they change. I mean, there are also um, frameworks where you have object functional, where the objects are not mutated, but object oriented, you have methods that modify an object. Then you have functional programming, and maybe I should write here F sharp and C sharp on the top. Yeah, that's also maybe a small typo. That should be here an F sharp. Then you have functional lang languages like F sharp, Scala, but you also find these concepts in C++ and Java. I mean, you can do functional programming also in other, other languages where functions always create a new object. So objects do not change. Objects are inputs to creating new objects. So what is quantum computing? So unitary operators modify a quantum state. It looks a little bit like the world you have in object-oriented programming. You modify an object. So if you like to draw this comparison, it is a little bit like that. Um, what is the parallelism? Yeah, the parallelism is really, really different. I mean, in a classical computer, you can distinguish between multiple instruction, multiple data. So a multi-core CPU can run several independent threads. And then you have single instruction, multiple data, like in a graphic card. So you have the same operation operating on a vector in parallel uh, in synchronicity. So in both uh, setups, instruction may depend on a single element of a vector, yeah? so, but you would like to avoid divergence of the execution part, uh, path in single instruction, multiple data. But this is the kind of parallelism you maybe know. So people who have seen my GPU lecture know that you can maybe run this little program to visualize the difference of these two different types of parallelism. Okay, not so of interest here. For a quantum computer, it looks a little bit as if we are like in this graphic card world, single instruction, multiple data, because we have one unitary operator that operates in superposition on all the possible values. Yeah. But I believe that this interpretation is not 100% right. And maybe if you have looked at the algorithm which we have discussed, you understand that maybe this is not the right view, or it's not a good view, uh, or it's missing maybe a little point, um, because the unitary operator, as I expl explained in the beginning, it can map one value to different probabilities or different better coefficients on different values. It can create a superposition. Yeah? So it looks a little bit as uh, the quantum computer is like single instruction, multiple data, but instead of mapping values to values, the operators rather map the coefficients to coefficients. Yeah? Uh, and an important thing is that um, the coefficients may cancel. Yeah? So the trick in the previous algorithm relied on the fact that we can create operations such that the right things cancel and um, uh, you can then immediately see uh, the answer yeah, in um, a state that has been amplified. We may reveal the um, probability. Yeah? So we may reveal the square 
absolute value square of such a coefficient uh, by repeating calculations. So, and performing uh, measurements. And the algorithms work by representing in solution is increasing the probability to measure something. So it's a different, different uh, kind of uh, work. Yeah, we do do here. Yeah. So uh, so find a state representing a, a solution means increase uh, the probability. And creating this interference can be exponentially faster. For example, if you can work on the bits instead of working on all uh, the states, yeah, like in uh, the last uh, um, example. Yeah, maybe a nice, uh, nice little uh, summary. Yeah? So, and also the bandwidth differs yeah, on a CPU with 10 to 100 threads and uh, 64 bits. How many, how many parallel bits do you have? Yeah, it's, it's a thousand parallel bits. On a GPU with 64 bits and uh, many threads, yeah, it's many more parallel bits on, on which you operate, but already um, a quantum register with 30 qubits has 1 billion superpositioned uh, states. Yeah? So it's maybe a smaller number of qubits, but the superposition states, uh, the number of different coefficients is, is much uh, larger. Yeah, so advantage, huge bait, bare bandwidth uh, and um, some some kind of parallelism built in. Uh, no cloning is a different is a disadvantage. And uh, the difference is that the parallelism is a certain different form yeah, in, in terms of this superposition. Yeah, so let me uh, conclude um, with the next algorithm, the quantum Fourier transform. So before I uh, shortly state the quantum Fourier transform, let me just uh, recall the discrete uh, Fourier transform. So you find this written in different forms. Yeah. So uh, assume you have um, a finite sequence xn, n from zero to capital N minus one, which can be considered as equidistant sample points of uh, a periodic function of an input function. Uh, then you define a capital XK, uh, the Fourier coefficient for uh, K, yeah, K is associated now with a, with a uh, certain uh, frequency, um, as uh, one divided by square root of N, the sum Xn, my original sequence, multiplied with a kernel, and the kernel is E to the I to P divided by N, K times N. Uh, you find this in different forms. Sometimes for the Fourier transform, this, this norming here is missing. And sometimes you have a minus here, then you will have a plus in the inverse. No? But actually that doesn't matter. So I have, I have now this form here. So don't be confused if you, if you, if you see later um, um, a difference there. So then this, is X, this XK is actually the coefficient of your Fourier um, um, series. So the inverse Fourier transform is then given here by the, by the uh, Fourier uh, series, which, which has exactly the same form. So um, I get back my uh, XK, uh, so sorry, my, my, my little X uh, uh, N, I get back my little X N by taking one divided by square root of N, some k from zero to n minus one. Now capital XK multiplied with a kernel and the kernel is now e to the minus i to p divided by n, k times n. Uh, you can write this as a matrix. Yeah? The, the, the matrix then has just 
these uh, with the, uh, these, these, these kernel elements. Uh, and you see that this is uh, actually a unitary matrix um, F. And that's the reason why I have here this one divided by square root of N. So sometimes you also find a one here and then a one divided by N there. Yeah, but then you do not have this nice uh, little property that it is a unitary uh, matrix. So that's why I have here the word uh, unitary um, in front. It's the unitary discrete uh, Fourier transform. Okay, so you, you know the Fourier transform is very useful. Yeah, the continuous Fourier transform has the compelling uh, property uh, that uh, the transform of a convolution, so integral f of x, g of y minus x, dx, uh, the convolution of two functions corresponds to the product of the uh, two transforms. So instead of calculating an integral convolution, you can transform the two integrands, multiply them and transform them back. And this um, is um, uh, yeah, the convolution property, convolution of two function corresponds to the product of the two transforms. Uh, so transforming back then allows to approximate the um, convolution. Yeah? Approximate if you use now the discrete Fourier transform, because the discrete Fourier transform can then be interpreted as approximating the integral. Uh, and the method is also uh, nicely applicable in the valuation of financial derivative. Yeah? So because you know the risk neutral valuation of a financial derivative is a convolution of the payoff function with the transition probability. Yeah? So that's a, a nice link now to mathematical finance, if you like. Uh, for, for that to be done, you have to apply some dampening factor. You also have to prepare a little bit your problem, but that is known how that uh, has to be done. A paper by Peter Carr and Madan. Okay, so now back to the quantum discrete Fourier transform. So how can we now define this um, in um, a quantum computer? And uh, I already mentioned, this is a unitary operator. So this is a unitary matrix, yeah, the Fourier transform. So it is maybe obvious that we can have a unitary operator associated with this uh, Fourier transform, this discrete Fourier transform in my quantum computer. So that is just here um, a definition. The quantum Fourier transform is given by the unitary operator F on my two to the power of N dimensional uh, tensor space. And the operator looks more or less exactly like what we had. Uh, so um, it's E to the two PI x times y, this is now my k times n, divided by capital N, this is my divided by two to the power of n. And then which guy is mapped to which guy? Well, state y is mapped to state x. Huh? So you recall that this state, this guy here, this um, notation means that I map the basis state y to the basis state uh, x. And this is the sum over all uh, elements X uh, and Y that form my basis in my tensor space with some norming constant. But this is um, a unitary operator. Okay, maybe we have to prove uh, this. Yeah, maybe you would have now uh, the task to prove this. Uh, I just state a few results. So first, what's the link to the classical uh, Fourier transform? Well, that's maybe quite obvious. If you have now an arbitrary state in uh, your quantum register, so we have uh, a quantum register psi that has coefficients cx. So the cx are the coefficients that form the superposition uh, of this state psi. And now I interpret these cx as 
the input sequence of my Fourier transform. So this is here my vector C, yeah, uh, that is then associated with the input sequence to the Fourier transform. And then I apply now my quantum Fourier transform. So here I'm talking about the quantum Fourier transform. So I apply my quantum Fourier transform F to this state Psi. And if I then check the coefficient in front of cat K, which means I take the scalar product of K and this result. So I look at uh, pra K cat F Psi. If I then do that, I get my output vector DK and DK is the discrete Fourier transform of C. But that's just because this is an autonormal basis. Yeah? And if you just multiply this, you just get here, instead of the X, you get the C case. Yeah? And then if you just multiply uh, with the K, you just get the corresponding uh, coefficient for the corresponding K. So that's uh, the maybe obvious uh, link. Yeah? So we have um, a quantum um, gate that represents a Fourier transform. And here's now the implementation in terms of gates. So the operator F can be constructed from simple gates. We need uh, N half swap gates. We need some Hadamard gates and we need this conditional phase shift gate. The conditional phase shift gate, if the other bit is a one, then multiply with a certain rotation with a certain phase. And the rotation which we use uh, is getting uh, smaller and smaller, which is the Fourier basis. Um, okay, so you see uh, what you do here is, uh, there is um, here a product, which means, concatenation of the operators, um, apply to every bit the Hadamard gate first, and then apply to the J's bit a conditional phase shift that depends on the K other bits, K running from zero to J minus one, so conditional to the previous one, um, with smaller and smaller rotations. And then in the end, you do um, a swap because actually this procedure will reverse the bit order and some author also um, omit this. Yeah? So uh, if you get it in reverse order or in other order, yeah, I mean, maybe it doesn't matter. So how many gates are these? Uh, so uh, you, you have here conditions on the other bits and then you do this for all bits. So it's N times N, yeah, actually half, yeah. Uh, or a little bit more, n times n minus one, yeah, phase shifts. Uh, so it's like n squared. So we need order n squared of these elementary gates. You see, my Fourier transform is on a state space that is has two to the power of n different values. Yeah, It's like a discrete Fourier transform on two to the power of n values. The sequence, my sequence has so many values, but I only need order n squared uh, gates. Yeah? It's also exponential speed up. So this is here the uh, circuit for uh, n uh, equals, uh, capital N equals 16, so four bits. Hadamard gate, three phase shift, Hadamard gates, two phase shift, Hadamard gate, one phase shift, Hadamard gate, and in the end, um, a swap. Uh, so the performance is order in squared. Yeah, we require so many quantum gates to perform this discrete uh, Fourier transform, the discrete Fourier transform on N states. Yeah, So that is the small N is uh, log capital N divided by log two. 
So the um, classical, uh, so if you if you would write now the the performance in terms of the capital N, so this means I'm order log capital N squared. Uh, so this is log N times log N. The classical discrete uh, Fourier transform requires order n squared. And if you use the fast Fourier transform, which is dividing uh, the work yeah, uh, in, into smaller parts and uh, improving the algorithm, then the, the fastest thing, I believe the fastest thing that it can be done for the classical fast Fourier transform is order n times log n. Yeah? So you see, I get another n moving to a log. So let's conclude with um, the proof. So it's actually now the proof that these guys here will construct the right matrix. And it's more a sketch of proof. I, I will do it a bit quickly. So let's um, have a proof. For the proof, actually one thing is a little bit helpful. It's the so-called binary fraction. That looks a little bit strange. Yeah? but um, Actually, it's a trivial thing, and it's uh, just uh, a notational laziness that I would like to uh, omit the divided by two to the power of n. So if you have a bit sequence, a binary sequence, say uh, a1 to am yeah, is a binary sequence, uh, like 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and so on, then we can define 0 point a1, a2 is the sum aj2 to the power of minus j. Hmm? Okay, so what's that? Okay, small example. If you have, say, 0 0.1011, it's like what you have in decimals. Yeah? It is one half. Yeah, it is actually this one here is that one, it is this zero here is that zero, yeah? zero multiplied with one over four. It is this one here, no, maybe take another color. This one here is one over eight. Yeah? So it's a binary fraction. Yeah? Instead of going two to the power of j, it goes two to the power of minus j. And that would just be the representation of the number 0.6875. Uh, so um, it's a discretization of the numbers between zero and one, one not included. So if x is an integer represented by a binary sequence of bits. Yeah? So this is here your classical binary sequence of bits. And you represent now x as xj. So actually there's a typo here that should be a j. xj times two to the power of j. Then I get this by just uh, dividing with two to the power of uh, n. Huh? Okay, so that is a helpful thing because now um, the first claim is that the quantum Fourier transform um, acts as uh, the tensor product of cat zero plus e to the 2p times O point, the binary fraction xj to x0, cat one for the j's bit. So I get more and more of these uh, uh, fractions. So you see, this is more or less what falls on the definition of the f, yeah? except that here, uh, you could write here also the bit sequence. So you could just write the X divided by two to the power of N. So that's just um, a, a reformulation of the definition of the quantum Fourier transform. Um, so now if I have this reformulation, we can immediately see that the, this sequence of gates create this co these coefficients because if you apply a Hadamard gate to xj, 
um, actually you get the superposition of zero and one, and you get here a plus if this bit was a zero. Uh, so I get an e to the zero, or I get here a minus if this bit was a one. So I can write this as e pi i x j, yeah, because um, with, with this one, this will be a rotation, a minus one. And now using the binary fraction, you can just write this as the binary fraction O point x j, because O point x j is one half, and one half multiplied with two is exactly this one. Yeah. If x j is one, or it is zero, yeah, then it also agrees. So you see that the Hadamard gate is like a rotation yeah, to the other side. It creates here a plus one or a minus one. And now you see that the phase shift gates by these smaller angles will create here just um, two P divided by four. Two P divided by four is P divided by, by two. It's this. And um, the smaller phase shifts will then create here the uh, smaller uh, um, values. So on the bit, on the qubit zero, if the qubit zero is zero, I get here uh, one divided by two j, uh, uh, two to the power of j times um, uh, two p, yeah? otherwise not. So you see that the sequence of this Hadamard gate and the phase shift gate exactly create this, uh, this coefficient. Yeah, maybe it was uh, only a sketch of proof, maybe it was a little bit quick, yeah, but you get a little bit the intuition that these elementary gates create this. Okay, and that was uh, it for this little uh, lecture. Yeah, so we saw three nice algorithm, Kova algorithm, yeah, quadratic improvement to find this state, uh, deutsch josa algorithm, exponential improvement to find the answer to this question. And also what's nice is uh, in the internet, you sometimes find an illustration of this algorithm um, that looks a little bit that you can construct this with, with light, yeah, where light is going through gates and then the interference is creating the answer. And this is also maybe a nice view, yeah. Uh, for example, for, 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 uh, sometimes in books, yeah, you have this nice uh, little uh, color picture uh, where you, you see nothing, but if you add a filter to it, say a polarization filter or a green and red filter or whatever, suddenly you see, see stuff. And this is a little bit how this stuff works, yeah. You make transformations and suddenly you see the answer immediately without checking everything. And for this uh, Deutsch algorithm, there is a little bit this interpretation that you can create this interference where the answer is suddenly popping up uh, in, 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 in really a, um, a, a machine in an um, experiment. Yeah, and maybe the, the quantum Fourier transform is um, a nice last example because it is uh, really something that is uh, uh, used uh, in many places, yeah, the Fourier transform. So that was it. Thank you. I have a few references here, uh, um, a book uh, I can recommend by Wolfgang Scherer and the original article uh, where this um, algorithm popped up. Yeah, so you see uh, that there is some, some uh, link here. Yeah, maybe you can can take a look. And there are also more uh, references in the uh, CERC uh, documentation that you find uh, in the internet.